Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. This webinar is brought to you by the Nazarian Centre for Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm Dov Waxman, the Director of the Nazarian Centre and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'd just like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Lev Centre for Jewish Studies, the Centre for the Study of Religion and the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA. I'm delighted to be introducing our guest speaker this afternoon, or perhaps this evening, depending on where you are in the world, Professor Yakov Yadgar. He's been a visiting professor at Rutgers University and Columbia University. He received his PhD from Baralan University. Professor Yadgar has written extensively about Jewish identity, nationalism, secularism, modernity, and tradition in Israel. His previous books include Sovereign Jews, Israel, Zionism, and Judaism, published in 2017, and Secularism and Religion in Jewish-Israeli Politics, Traditionalists and Modernity, published in 2011. He's going to be talking to us today about his latest book entitled Israel's Jewish Identity Crisis, State and Politics in the Middle East, which is published this year by Cambridge University Press. Thank you, Professor Yadgar, for joining us. Thank you, Doug, for having me in this uh, brilliant series of yours. Thank you. So um, Professor Yadgar will um, make his presentation for about 30 minutes and then we will open it up for uh, questions. So I want to encourage you uh, to please, using the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, to send in your questions and we'll have plenty of time to, uh, to talk about them and to hear uh, Professor Yadgar answer your questions uh, at the end of his talk. So thank you, Professor Yadgar. Thank you, Doug. Again, thank you for the invitation to uh, present my work and participate in your series. Um, let me open with a few, uh, well, a series of questions that highlight, I believe, a uh, gravitational pull of uh, Israeli politics. What is the meaning of Israeli nationhood as distinct from, if not opposed to, Jewish nationhood? How does an Israeli nationalism correspond with the state's assumed self-identification as Jewish? What does this Jewishness of the state mean in the first place? In other words, what is the meaning of Jewish sovereignty in Israel? How does Israel's yet to be fully determined, regardless of the ongoing debates around it, identity as a Jewish state or self-identification as a Jewish state? And I must this, uh, I add that this is already more than 70 years into nation statehood. How does this shape the state's stance towards its non-Jewish, mainly Palestinian Arab citizens? Where does it leave uh, non-Jewish, non-Arab citizens of Israel? How does this uh, apparent entanglement of uh, religion and politics shape Israel's position in the Middle East? And lastly, how does the state's claim to Jewish identity shape the relations between Jewish-Israeli nationhood and Jewish communities outside of the Jewish state? Now, obviously, answering this, uh, li these questions in full is indeed a monumental task. My book is only an attempt to offer at least a partial answer to some of these questions. What I would uh, want to do here, uh, this evening here in, uh, in Oxford or this afternoon uh, in uh, LA, is to suggest a certain key for tackling these issues and other issues derived from them by refocusing the discussion on the Israeli nation state's unresolved relationship with its own claim to what, it, what is commonly understood as a non-religious, not to say secular, Jewish identity. In other words, I would suggest that all of these questions or issues I've just raised have to do with what can be safely termed Israel's Jewish identity crisis. This crisis is to a large extent a direct outcome of what is often called the project of modernizing, secularizing, and politicizing Judaism. This project has been to a large extent built upon two primary arguments or negations. First, it would deny the argument or counter the argument originally developed by Central European Jews in the 18th century, that Judaism is only, quote unquote, or even primarily a religion, which is non-political by its very nature. Put positively, the argument developed mostly in 19th century Europe by both European nationalists who were largely anti-Semites and Jewish nationalists who countered them. The argument was that Judaism is in essence primarily a political identity or political entity, 
as the term is understood in the context of European secular nation states. Second, the same Jewish nationalist political project would negate what it calls Jewish exile, which it defines once again using the European conceptual toolkit as a non-modern malignant case of religiousness. I will get back to this, mate, uh, to this matter later on and uh, expand it on it a little bit, but I want to stress already at this point that in its height, this double or dual negation would bring about the rather interesting phenomena of Zionist ideological pioneers who are so vehemently opposed to any notion of Jewishness that they would prefer not to be called Jews at all. They would ultimately uh, um, they would prefer usually to be called Hebrews or other names. But this tension would ultimately feed the aforementioned sense of alienation or, or even resentment over Jewish history that is prevalent among uh, the elite of a state that self-defines as the state of Jews, if not even as a Jewish state. Now, I would argue that Zionism's and Israel's inability or maybe simply lack of interest to formulate a viable national identity that is independent from, uh, independent of what the self-proclaimed secularist Zionist ideology itself is viewed largely negatively as Jewish religion, renders the state's definition of Jewish politics and Jewish sovereignty a problematic matter to say the least. Zionism entails a transition from the understanding of Jewish identity through a dialogue with diverse traditions to a so-called natural or ethno-national definition of this identity. It moves away from the notion that it is Judaism that defines the Jewish person. Instead, it argues that the Jews proceed and in effect define Judaism. It does so by adopting, it does so, I'm sorry, by adopting um, organic notions of identity that were prevalent mostly in Eastern Europe of its time, according to which Jewishness is determined by one's quote unquote blood. This in effect conditions the viability of Jewish politics in Israel on the active preservation of a so-called biological or ethnic Jewish majority. To understand my point here, and I know it's a little bit uh, uh, well, complex, it may be helpful to consider the traditional view and contrast it with the Zionist revolutionary view of the meaning of Jewishness. I think we can safely say that historically, Judaism, however understood, preceded the Jew. As put by Leon Roth, another Oxford uh, uh, professor who then became a Hebrew University professor, when he discusses the biblical notion of the Israelites being a holy nation, and I'm quoting him, Judaism is not to be considered in terms of the Jews, but the Jews in terms of Judaism. Judaism is not what some or all individual Jews happen as a fact to do. It is what Jews should be doing, but often are not doing, as members of a holy people. Judaism comes first. It is not a product, but a program. And the Jews are the instruments of its fulfillment." End of quote. In other words, a Jew is someone who does Judaism, or at least should do Judaism. Judaism is what defines the Jew. This would also mean that one's being a Jew has nothing of substance to do with the biological chance of his or her origin. To quote Roth again, when it is said that the Jewish people is the bearer or carrier or transmitter of Judaism, the phrase Jewish people has to be understood in the widest sense. In principle, the tie constituting this people is not one of race or blood, end of quote. Now the Zionist idea rebelling against this tradition in many different ways a tradition which it has, it has marked as anachronistic and religious, Zionism would proclaim that the Jew precedes Judaism. And I'm paraphrasing here really a long list of Zionist writers from Yosef Chaim Brenner to Aleph Bet Yoshua. Judaism, they would say, has no essential features of its own. The matter of the survival of Judaism, which has preoccupied Jews for generations, is not a relevant concern anymore. Judaism is everything that Jews, or to be precise, national Jews, Zionists, do. 
whether it corresponds to traditional understandings of Judaism or not is largely irrelevant. What is relevant is that it is the outcome of the doings of Jews. Read politically in the context, in the context of a sovereign nation state of Jews, this idea has been understood to mean that the ethnic or biological makeup of Israel, the Israeli population is a precondition of the state's upholding of its very constitutive logic. Israel in this understanding is only or simply a state of Jews. It is not a Jewish state in the sense of answering to some normative sense of Judaism. This indeed, it, it has been a rallying cry of the uh, secularist liberal Zionist camp to this day. Um, liberal Zionists would, or secular Zionists uh, would argue that the only viable meaning of Jewish sovereignty is that it is a sovereignty held by Jews. Yet, as anyone who is even slightly familiar with um, Israel would know, or anyone who follows the news from Israel would know, this is not the prevailing sense in the country. Indeed, the notion that Israel is indeed a Jewish, often accompanied by an democratic state, has been a staple of Israeli political discourse and uh, constitutional or quasi-constitutional legislation in recent, de in recent decades. But let us go back for a second. What would justify the Zionist claim for sovereignty in the first place? What would justify the admittedly violent history that has accompanied this claim, focused as it is on a land whose inhabitants at the time are largely neither Jewish nor Zionists? Well, the answer is simple. It's Jewish tradition and Jewish history, of course. Zionist ideology and socio, the sociopolitics of the state of Israel that are emanating from it entail then somewhat of a paradox. And I don't have a better term for that. First, propagating Jewish sovereignty or the sovereignty of Jews, Zionist ideology would claim that it is this sovereignty, or to be precise, its manifestation in the political form of a Jewish nation state that defines Jewish national identity. But the very struggle to achieve this sovereignty, and especially a campaign to achieve sovereignty over a land inhabited mostly by non-Jews, has been conducted and justified in the name of Jewish nationhood. So there must be a prior distinction, one that precedes sovereignty that defines Jewishness. Even in the narrowest of nationalist understandings of the meaning of political Zionism, that is a view of the state of Israel, not as a Jewish state, but as simply as a state of Jews, the question remains, what is a Jew? Now failing or neglecting to offer a fully fledged definition of Jewish national identity, a definition that would be independent from rabbinical readings of Jewish identity and of Judaism, that is not religious, yet at the same time zealously rebelling against this rabbinical authority and against religion in general, Zionism was left with a biological or so-called biological notion of Jewish identity. Tautologically, it would argue that a Jew simply is a Jew, that Jewishness is someone that someone is born with. One does not choose it, nor can one rid oneself of his or her Jewishness. It is, it's in one's blood. Now, this tautology, which has really dominated pre-state Zionist ideology and shaped much of the Zionist ideologues' discussions on their own Jewish identity and the identity of their project at large, it proved insufficient in the framework of a nation state that self-identifies as a state of Jews. So the establishment of the state uh, or the sovereign nation state of the Jews transformed this question of a meaningful identification of what Jewishness is from a cultural matter or from an ideological matter into an existentially political one. It bore directly on the state's survival as a nation state of Jews. This was specifically true since the state, following the logic of mainstream Zionist ideology, viewed itself as secular. So it could not explicitly rely on what it viewed as religious elements of Jewish identity for its own self-identification as a Jewish state. The state then chose not to, or maybe it was unable to, given its indebtedness to secularist epistemology and to secularist ideology, not to focus on maintaining a sovereignty that is Jewish, that is a sovereignty that 
dialogues with Judaism as a constituting tradition, but rather to maintain the sovereignty of Jews. Indeed, and I mentioned this already er uh, earlier, a dominant secularist liberal Zionist reading has been insisting that the secularity of the state means that it does not identify as Jewish at all. Uh, that is that the state does not carry a religious identity of its own, that its sovereignty cannot be meaningfully Jewish in this term. Rather, it is simply a state of those identified as Jews. Now again, this of course necessitates uh, a clear legalistic identification of Jews and the differentiation between Jews and non-Jews. That is, the state itself must play an active role in drawing a clear distinction between Jews and non-Jews and to mark the former, the Jews, as those whose state Israel is and to make them a majority while designating the latter a minority who in effect cannot claim full or equal participation in the sovereignty of Jews by definition. Most importantly, this definition of Israel as embodying the sovereignty of Jews demands that the state takes an active role in constructing, maintaining, and preserving its majority's Jewishness. The state, in other words, needs sovereign Jews for it to obey its constitutive logic and exercise its sovereignty in their name. It does, it, so it devotes uh, much attention and resources to the maintenance of those sovereign Jews as Jews. Now, in order to shed some light on the implication of this, let us consider a few of the contemporary enigmas or themes or challenges of Israeli sociopolitics. They have all to do with Israel's struggle to understand the meaning of its Jewishness. They all have to do, in other words, with Israel's Jewish identity crisis. So take, for example, the issue of religious conversion. If one reads the news from Israel, one can be indeed confused or perplexed. Why is the so-called secular, liberal media, as is the public debate in general, a public who is overwhelmingly, I must mention, non-orthodox by self-identification. Why are they so preoccupied with the minutiae and details of the orthodox interpretation and orthodox practice of Jewish law on matters of religious conversion into Judaism? Why have competing interpretations of Jewish religious law on matters of conversion become uh, the locus of uh, secular political debate? And why has the again, non-theocratic state by all definition itself, been so actively involved, mainly through the military of all states' institutions, in a, pro a program of mass conversion as a matter of religious orthodox practice of non-Jews, I should mention also who are non-Arabs, into Jewish religion. And how does this correspond with the status of non-Jewish -Pal non Palestinian Arabs uh, citizens in Israel? Or take another example, maybe the most uh, famous uh, currently, the controversial basic law, Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, which passed uh, uh, two years ago now, and seeks to enshrine and ensure constitutionally so the state of Israel's Jewish identity. Why does this law assert Israel's identity as the nation state of the Jewish people by negating or prohibiting recognition of other peoples, read Palestinians, similar claims for nationhood or to nationhood. Does a uh, declarative constitutional Jewishness of the state necessarily amount to an explicit commitment of the state to prefer Jews and their interests over non-Jews as the law has been understood? Does the law in actuality explicate that Israel's wish to be both Jewish and democratic is unachievable? as it seems to make the state's Jewish identity superior to its commitment to democracy? Maybe most importantly, how had it come to be that the law, originally proposed and advanced by so-called secular members of the Israeli parliament who adhere to a secularist Zionist discourse, how does it rely on Jewish tradition and Jewish law that is what is commonly referred to by the same secularist discourse as Jewish religion 
for the preservation and for the maintenance of the Jewish identity of the supposedly secular nation state. Also, why do parties, why have or uh, parties representing Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, been so visibly uncomfortable with this law, originally opposing it for a decade before ultimately caving in and uh, giving, giving the voices to, to it. And maybe as a last example, take the declarative ruling by the Israeli Supreme Court, I guess the most celebrated champion of liberal secularist Zionism, uh, um, a, a ruling that explicitly, rather vehemently, denies the viability of an Israeli national identity. There is no such thing as an Israeli nation. Thus said the Israeli Supreme Court, no other, repeatedly. What motivated the court to address this obviously ideological matter in the first place, and why did it view the possibility of acknowledging the viability of an Israeli national identity as a threat to Zionism and to the state of Israel. Put in a nutshell, all of these cases, uh, into the details of which I delve in my book, all of them touch upon an inherent, inherent I'm sorry, tension or contradiction between, on the one hand, a secularist discourse uh, and a conceptual framework which designates secular rational politics and religion into separate realms of human life. And well, reality, on the other hand, which does not obey these frameworks expectations. I think one of the most fruitful way to transcend the secularist discourse narrow horizon and to engage in an examination and maybe even a construction of its alternatives is is to identify the matters at hand not as an issue of religion and politics in Israel, as in two separate categories that clash in some uh, historically complicated matter, but rather as a quintessentially political issue of how we relate to our traditions. In other words, what I want to propose here is that we should or could at least engage in a critical Jewish, that is, uh, attentive to the message, in, messages, I'm sorry, entailed in the histories and traditions of Judaism, a Jewish reading of the unresolved charged nature of Israel's approach to the numerous histories of Jewish communities, histories that are manifested in the Jewish traditions that preceded the Zionist project and its culmination in the state of Israel. So this is the central issue, I think, should be addressed. The question, how does the nation state's theopolitics, that is an, an amalgamation of what we would usually call as uh, theology and politics, which uh, uh, are uh, uh, assigned to the sovereign, how, how is, the, is this theopolitics constituted, as it is, symbolically at least, on a created or invented or renewed national tradition how does it approach Jewish traditions that preceded it and that continue to live alongside it? So let us consider first the question of Zionism or how Zionist ideology has constructed its position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Jewish traditions that preceded it. And where, so the mainstream argument has claimed, uh, besmirched by the stain of religiosity. Now, several leading Zionist thinkers, one may count Theodor Herzl among them, chose largely to ignore or pass over this question and focused instead on the notion of Jewish political power or the political power of Jews by way of imagining the Jews state, which I think is, well, is one potential translation of uh, Judenstadt, as sort of a European nation state. Indeed, uh, probably a German speaking state, if we read Herzl's Alt Neuland with Ahad Am, that is ruled by Europeans of Jewish descent. Now other ideologues who were firstly critical of this neglect, foremost among them was of course Ahad Am, who flung at Herzl the, uh, the rhetorical or accusatory question, and I'm paraphrasing, what, what exactly is Jewish about your Judenstadt? They view the Zionist project as primarily obligated to secularize Judaism. That is to reinterpret Jewish traditions so as to make them consistent with the rationalist, modernist, utilitarian worldview, which will be in the mainstream political reading of Zionism, 
the basis of the secular nation state of the Jews. This notion of free interpretation fed the self-image of those socialist Zionist ideologues who arrived in Ottoman and later mandatory Palestine with the declared aim of rewriting the meaning of their Jewish or Hebrew identity. These pioneering role models, most of whom had received a traditional Jewish education and were driven by a sense of rebellion against the authority of the way of life into which they were born, they had an intimate, unmediated familiarity with certain Jewish traditions, mostly East European ones, and they sought to reinterpret parts of these traditions. Now, obviously, they often did so from a confrontational, aggressive position. But we must acknowledge that this too manifests a certain type of conversation with tradition, which is based on a familiarity with it. A rebellion against authority is also an acknowledgement of authority, and it is surely based upon a familiarity with it. But once the ideological enthusiasm has ebbed and the unmediated familiarity with tradition was lost, the children and grandchildren of these ideological pioneers were left with a sour residue of resentment against what they were taught to think of as tradition and religion, while they were largely ignorant of the contents of these objects of their hate or derision. They have, of course, remained identified as Jewish. Politically speaking, this part of their identity has been constitutive, overpowering every other ideological or normative commitment they might have. But the positive meaning of this identity, beyond the fact that they have committed, that they have been committed, I'm sorry, to the establishment of the nation state of Jews, which is their state, became increasingly vague. The dialogue between them and their Jewish traditions, it became gradually mute. Now, the establishment of the state of Israel did not resolve this tension, which could be seen as an alienation of the very elite of the Jewish state from Judaism itself. As I mentioned earlier, at the end, the state or its rulers or its elite, among which uh, um, the elite, among which uh, 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 a predominant secularist ideology prevailed, seems to have chosen to focus primarily on the constitution of a Jewish majority over a non-Jewish Palestinian Arab minority as the principal condition for its existence as the state of the Jewish people. The state put relatively few resources into answering the questions of how to converse with and reinterpret the Jewish traditions of the communities that constitute this majority. But even such a limited understanding of Jewish politics, that is, this is simply politics of a European-like nation state that is run by, Jewish of, uh, by people of Jewish origin, but even this decision, uh, definition required uh, to address certain issues of Jewish identity in order to run this nation state. Most obviously, the state is required to decide who counts as a Jew and who does not or to outline the borderlines uh, defining the very nation in whose name the state rules. Ultimately, the allegedly secular state chose not to carry this task. It is quite clear that Zionism has been unable to provide a fully fledged self-sufficient secular definition of Jewish identity. And it's, it's instead, it has in a sense outsourced this critical task to those that it in effect designates by force of its sovereignty as the official representatives or interpreters of Jewish religion, namely orthodox rabbis and politicians who adhere to a conservative notion of Jewish law, they function as the nation state's gatekeepers, whether they chose to or not to. They were appointed the state's gatekeepers. And they do so by uh, being assigned with the responsibility to decide who counts as a Jew. And they do this utilizing religious law, which they adhere to. And by being given the monopoly over, uh, uh, well, the monopolistic authority to manage Jewish uh, citizens' personal matters of marriage and divorce, in effect, preventing marriages between Jews and non-Jews in Israel, and thus preserving the distinction between the two groups. Um, the state has viewed the diversity of Jewish tradition also, I should mention, uh, which uh, immigrant communities carried with them to the newly established state as a threat to national unity, and it devoted its resources and attention mostly to this abusive project of the melting pot, which, as the name suggests, 
view these traditions as objects that should be dissolved in order to, for another newly constructed national tradition to gain hold. Now, it maybe is uh, maybe I should not mention it. Need this to say, but never mind. Let, let me remind us that the state still espouses a notion of a distinction between Jewish religion and Jewish nationality, which is presumably secular. Yet the political and legal debates surrounding the paradoxes or dilemmas that this distinction creates have clearly demonstrated that the state, as well as the culture it has built. They remain loyal to the notion that these two categories are essentially identical. The idea stands, this idea stands at the core of the national school curriculum, and it feeds a series of laws which enforce a certain notoriously narrow interpretation of Jewish tradition uh, on the public sphere, aimed at uh, uh, to end up preserving the Jewish character or the Hebrew Tzivyon Yehudi of the state and its uh, public sphere. So this is, and maybe I should uh, uh, conclude with this point, this is the key to understanding the Israeli status quo. It is not, at least not primarily so, a matter of compromise and uh, submission of the secular majority to the whims of the religious minority. Rather, it is an expression of the reliance of the state who is, it should be stressed again, still ruled by representatives of the same non-religious majority on a narrow so-called religious interpretation of the meaning of Jewish traditions for the purpose of regulating the public sphere, public sphere and administrating national politics which are seen as politics of a majority of Jews. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, before we, we have some questions coming in and I'd like to encourage uh, everyone out there to send in some more questions for us. Um, before I um, read up some of the questions that have come in, let me begin first of all with my taking the prerogative of uh, posing a couple of my own. Um, you know, you, you, in, in terms of this um, dilemma, that Israel faces and of trying to define its, uh, its Jewish identity. Um, is it, my first question is kind of zooming out. Is this dilemma implicit in the way in which modernity kind of separates the concepts of religion and nation, right? So in, in, a, in a way it's built into our very, the, the very terms, religion, uh, ethnicity. So Judaism, Jews, if you like, don't fit yeah. um, these modern categories, ne have never fitted these. And so the very being forced, whether it be in Israel or in fact in the Jewish diaspora as well, to try to fit themselves into these modern categories um, of, you know, are they an ethnic group? Are they a religious group? Are they a national group? In a sense, necessarily was, results in this kind of identity crisis, yeah. if you like, not only in Israel, but across the Jewish world, because they're trying to conform to categories of modernity that really aren't um, ultimately suited to, to Jewishness. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, one of the main uh, themes of uh, modern Jewish history, specifically with a European dominance of the discussion on European Jewish identity, has been this entanglement of a discussion of Jews, on Jews, on Judaism and Jewish identity into epistemological, conceptual, uh, terminological uh, uh, um, toolkits that are born of a, uh, an alien or a separate tradition, the, the Christian one and the European history of specifically Central and Western European history that designates starting at a certain point in history, politics and religion as two separate uh, uh, realms. Um, I think uh, maybe one of the uh, starkest formulations of this problem comes from uh, no other than uh, A.B. Yoshua, whom I mentioned earlier. Um, A.B. Yoshua is committed to this discourse, but then he identifies in one of his famous essays the problem as uh, an issue of melting as opposed to welding. So in the history of Europe, he says, religion and politics have been welded together, and then the separation of church and state has been a relatively easy process of breaking apart two welded uh, organs, while in the Jewish case, it, uh, religion and nationality have been melted together. So a clear amputation, which is what he's seeking, amputation of religion away from nationality, is an impossibility. 
I think that this, this kind of discourse is futile to begin with. As you said, Judaism is neither and, all of those the above. It's a, it's a race, if you want, it's a tradition, it's, uh, it's an ethnicity, it's a nationality, it's religion, but it's none of the above because it doesn't fit those Christian categories. Um, if you ask me how we could, uh, in a sense, transcend this, I think what's essentially is missing, what's essentially missing from the discussion currently taking place or at least dominating the discussion, uh, the, the, the public discourse, is a Jewish engagement with these questions. That is, uh, dialoguing with tradition that brings whatever tradition can give us into this debate. So trying, in a sense, to bring a, a more, um, how would I say, it, authentic sense of what Jewish peoplehood, Jewish nationhood, Judaism could be. And, um, um, I mean, it seems to me that there's a similar, that in, a, in, in, in a different context, but there's that kind of a similar crisis of Jewishness in, in outside of Israel, which is not resolved, of course, by the state. Could yeah. then, um, I mean, the answer that Jews elsewhere in the United States, in Great Britain and other places seem to have kind of improvised is that Jewishness and Jewish identity relies, is, is really defined by a shared collective memory. Right? And so it's the maintenance and particularly the, the um, uh, Holocaust memory. Yes. So the maintenance of that, that really is, what, you know, to the extent to which you participate and, and remember and, and have that collective memory, that defines your Jewishness. Yes. yes. Uh, obviously, there's obviously a problem with that. Uh, for a whole nation to be constituted on the memory of persecution alone, um, I mean, there are many, many problematic issues that emanate from it. One interesting element, maybe I should, I should just mention this, you know, um, I'm speaking here from the UK and then there's a debate going on regarding uh, uh, plans to erect a monument uh, commemorating the Holocaust. Uh, and there's a debate raging within the Jewish community regarding this because of the disagreement on the message of this collective memory. Uh, different parties have different aspirations regarding the message to be entailed in, in such a monument. So even this uh, relative, almost obvious point of reference of this uh, collective persecution of uh, the Jews can be read in ways that are, um, well, uh, competing, conflicting with each other. But, even, but beyond that, I think uh, um, a narrowing down of a tradition of so many years and so many aspects and so many uh, uh, positive elements into this negativity of the hatred to Jews um, is something we should be very wary of. So I want to turn, thank you, I want to turn now to some of the questions that we've come in. The first one actually pertained to a point you made just a moment ago. Um, when you introduced the concept of Jews are those who do Judaism versus uh, you know, Judaism creates Jews versus Jews. Uh, so the Judaism creates Jews as opposed to Jews created Judaism dichotomy. Yeah. Um, so that, that the question comes from uh, Reinhard Krauss. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, is that view of, you know, Jews are those who do Judaism, that Jews are, Judaism is a set of, it's defined by shared beliefs and practices. Is that essentially a Christian understanding? Is that structurally similar to what, how Christianity has defined Jude, Jews? Well, uh, I think we cannot ex uh, escape the fact that a lot of the uh, different ways in which Jews viewed or Jewish people have viewed themselves was uh, fed by or corresponding with the way non-Jews have been uh, also uh, looking at the Jews. Uh, maybe, well, maybe the most obvious that should be mentioned in this regard is uh, that the term Judaism itself is an alien term. It comes out, it comes actually from Christianity into Judaism. And I can mention uh, the work by Daniel Boyarvin with the book, with the title Judaism, uh, gen uh, giving us a genealogy of this term. Um, but I think it, we still can, uh, by studying uh, the tradition, as for example, Leon Roth is doing in a book, is, which is the history of Judaism, not history of your Jews, um, uh, we can still correspond and see how different understanding of these traditions, and there's no one understanding of this, 
have all, in a sense, ended up with this correspondence between an ethic or a Torah, a teaching, and then the conducting of personal and communal life. So the order has been such that there is, uh, that people is defined by uh, uh, a message regarding the proper conducting of personal and collective life. Um, whether this is uh, a, an inherently authentic intra-Jewish definition, or maybe it has some, um, you know, Christian element, Christian elements played into it, I think is a little uh, less problematic a question at this point. So um, I, I want to um, ask a, a question that's come from uh, Gary Gilbert um, yeah. about Jewishness in Israel, and you mentioned how you, the the Israeli state has had to rely upon an orthodox definition of Jewishness and essentially, you know, empower the rabbinical establishment to uh, decide on matters of who is a Jew. Um, would, the question asks, would state recognition of non-orthodox religious leaders and institutions and practice um, help resolve this? And I, I guess I would add on that, based upon what you're saying, is it even possible for the state to, to allow for multiple definite to, to actually allow for non-orthodox definitions and practices given the fact that they have to rely upon a single definition i mean what yeah. does this so i guess the question what does this mean for the understanding of jewishness that in fact most jews in the united states have yes i think uh, yeah and obviously the uh, uh, debate surrounding uh, the the state of Israel's choice to give a monopoly, and this is a choice made by a non-orthodox majority, we have to, rem to uh, keep this in mind, to give the orthodox ra uh, rabbinical authority a monopoly over conversions, which are in effect, and formally, the only gateway for joining the Jewish people in Israel. So uh, other nation states have uh, uh, paths towards citizenship, Israel, Israel's uh, path towards na uh, joining the nation is only through the religious gate, which most Israeli Jews don't care about, uh, the, the contents of which. Um, so it, and it's a very interesting uh, uh, exercise to think what would happen if Israel did not grant this uh, uh, orthodox monopoly, or did, that, did not grant this monopoly to the orthodox, and instead accepted all uh, conversions from the main Jewish denominations, uh, among which orthodoxy is a minority, specifically the North American case. Um, so first of all, this would still be a religious pathway. It would still be, a, by definition, non-political gateway towards political participation. So in a sense, the tension would remain. Why would you need a rabbi, whether he is an orthodox or she is a reform rabbi, why would you need them to grant someone uh, the membership card that comes from religion when you view yourself as, you know, purely political and a-religious as, as an entity. So that would be one um, question that comes to mind. And obviously, I think the contestation regarding uh, conversion in Israel, which has focused on that, it, I mean, the, the debate oscillated between just demanding opening up of uh, conversions to all and some, um, how would I say, compromise solutions where the rabbinical establishment is forced to maybe accept some leniency in its rulings. This is still captured in the notion, the whole this debate, I'm sorry, is captured in the notion that the way to join the Jewish people is through Jewish religion. So uh, it wouldn't solve this problem it would create from Israel's self-conception point of view, another problem. What would happen if due to the relative, uh, how would they say, uh, relatively easier path of conversion that non-Orthodox denomination offer, what would, if, uh, what would happen if mass groups of non-Jews within the Israeli society decide to convert? Um, and then there's an issue, I mean, would, uh, the, I think part of the problem is that in Israeli secular majority, there is a sense of, um, uh, how would I say, suspicion of the non-Orthodox denominations. And um, 
Well, I guess I should leave this at that. This is really just, I'm, uh, I'm digressing to another issue here. But um, um, if we remain, let me just say that if we remain in the realm of uh, religious conversion, we, re we really didn't solve the problem that I'm referring to. Thanks. So um, one question comes from uh, Rob Rader, uh, who asks, um, how do other nation, so-called nation states, states that claim to represent a specific nation, deal with this issue of ethnic identity? I mean, in some ways, uh, is Israel exceptional in, 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 its, in, in the difficulty it has in defining an ethnic Jewishness outside of religion? Or is in fact, many kind of ethno-national states really struggle with the same uh, fundamental yeah, yeah. issue? It's a great question. And there's always this tension, you know, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Anyone who's in this discussion and uh, either teaches or researcher or, or, or listens to debates on Israel knows that there's always this tension between just identifying Israel as unique and just then just saying, you know, it's just another case of so many other similar cases. Um, I think both at the same time. I mean, it's true. And I try to stress this specifically at the conclusion of my book that in a way, the story that I was telling is not an Israeli unique story. It's uh, liberal, democratic, secular story par excellence. We see this here again in uh, Western Europe, all the same when all of a sudden uh, confronted with waves of immigration of non-European, non-Christians, the majority reasserts it's not just uh, Christianity or Britness or Englishness, uh, it reasserts Europe's own identity with a tradition, with an ethnicity, with uh, specifically the different nation states. Uh, and in this regard, really, and if we take the Middle Eastern states, among which Israel should be counted, not necessarily a European state, um, this wouldn't be such a, um, a unique case. What's unique about it, that it's the only state that has to grapple with Jewish tradition when it comes about doing this. Um, you know, sitting here as I am in what is called the School of Area Studies, I do meet many scholars and many friends who think about the same questions, but through completely different contexts. And it's fascinating to see how some of the play, I mean, the, the, the game plays play the same way. So if you think about Pakistan, who establishes itself as a Muslim state and then has to make Muslim identity into a national identity. And obviously <laughs> Islam doesn't fall into these European categories. Uh, and if you think about uh, Iran and its uh, claims of uh, yeah, Shia and Muslim and, and Iranian identity, you can see a lot of similarities and a lot of interesting parallels. But then again, none of them has to do this thing, this Jewish question. Um, and Judaism presents to us with some obvious uh, uh, unique issues. Probably the most important in this context is that what we understand in Judaism, what we put with the ism at the end of it, at least, you know, historical rabbinical Judaism has developed in the state of lack of sovereignty. That we don't have a tradition of sovereignty. We have rules of what would happen when the Messiah comes, but um, this is not a political tradition of a state. So speaking of the, um, some similarities between Israel and other countries in the region and, uh, and Muslim states, we have a question from uh, Lev Greenberg, Professor Greenberg. Um, in the Muslim world, there's a new approach emerging on the relationship between religion and the state uh, called post-Islam. And this yeah. is the, uh, you know, the position that's been put forward by Islam is that essentially merging the religion and state causes damage primarily to religion, but to both, and there's a need to separate it. So he's asking if it's similar to imagine a kind of post-Jewish state or post-Jewishness, um, and what would be the implications of trying to have that separation? Would yes. it weaken Jewish identity in your opinion in Israel, I think? Or in fact, as I think post-Islamists might argue, uh, maybe strengthen it, it might lead in fact to Israeli Jews to have a better attitude towards Judaism if there's the separation between state and Judaism. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a brilliant question and I couldn't, you know, uh, invite it specifically because I wrote a chapter on it in my book. And um, there is actually in Israel, uh, among the, specifically among the secularist Zionist left, 
uh, a rather persistent call for doing exactly that. Uh, let's call it the post-Jewish. I think it's mostly, it's mostly a Jewish or even anti-Jewish Israeli identity. The roots of this, obviously, for anyone who knows the history of uh, Israel and the Zionist idea, the roots of this are pretty deep. They go back to the Canaanites or the New Hebrew, a, a, a movement, an ideological movement of, uh, how would I call it, um, uh, committed nationalists who were anti-Jewish and then also because of that anti-Zionist, because they viewed Zionism as indebted too much to, uh, to Judaism. Um, maybe the most uh, um, famous iteration of this right now is the call for an Israeli nationality or an Israeli identification, which is not Jewish. And I mentioned this earlier in my, uh, my short talk. Um, there has been attempt actually by this relatively small elite, but nevertheless vocal elite, to uh, get the state identify them as members of the Israeli nation and not the Jewish nation. And they would say so explicitly that they do not feel Jewish, that even if their parents were Jewish, they, they no longer identify as Jewish. And for them, it's the Israeliness that defines them. What's fascinating here is primarily, first and foremost, the reaction by the state and by the Israeli court, a vehement rejection of this. So the Israeli court not only says that you, uh, uh, well, he says you, you're welcome to say whatever you want about yourself, but there is no such thing as a post-Jewish Israeliness. There is no such thing as post-Jewish nationalism. And I think this goes to the root of the problem, maybe without acknowledging it. A post-Jewish Israeli identity would still have to manage an Israeli-Palestinian conflict and to justify it. I think that's part of the problem. At the moment, those who proclaim a post-Jewish uh, or a non-Jewish or an a-Jewish solution to the Israeli uh, identity crisis are still indebted to the notion of a nation state. So they would usually be a two-statist uh, supporters. So they would support a, a, a separation of Jews and Palestinians. But uh, they would still have to explain, in a sense, to justify a uh, historical project that was built on Jewish claims mm. and ended up with this position of non-Jews. That's very interesting. So we have a question from uh, Luke Yarbrough, who's a professor in the Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department at UCLA. Um, where have the secular Zionist elite come down on the Jewishness or citizenship status of Jews by descent who actively espouse religions other than Judaism? As a test case, can they shed light on the de facto intuitions on the question of who is a Jew in Israel? I think the, you're, you know, this may uh, pertain to the kind of famous brother Daniel case, yes. um, but uh, I'll let you answer. Yes, that. yes. Uh, so this is, I mean, the, the, the question who is a Jew and the history of the debate over who is a Jew is, uh, is a fascinating case in itself. I touch upon it a little bit in my book. There's, there has been so much written about it already. Uh, what I suggested earlier is that ultimately the, this history, and I'll give a few you know, um, details about it, but I think the way to understand it is that ultimately um, the Israeli courts and the Israeli political elite, and more obviously also the Israeli majority, the Jewish Israeli majority, accept that there's a conflation of um, religious identity and national identity. So you can't be Jewish by nationality and Christian by religion as Daniel Rufheisen or brother Daniel uh, asked the, the state to, uh, to identify him. Now, the picture is complicated by the um, law of returns expensive application to people who are, let's say, of Jewish descent or are related to Jews, but are not Jewish by any, uh, by any measure, neither by their self-identification nor, that, nor, that, nor by rabbinical understanding. So famously co corresponding with the Nuremberg laws, kind of countering them I mean, the, the roots of this are still debated, but Famously, the law of return, uh, which grants almost immediate citizenship to Jews, 
also grants this immediate citizenship to uh, relative of Jews, sons and daughters and uh, third generation, so grandchildren of Jews and their spouses also. So uh, which created the, the phenomena, I mean the reality, I'm sorry, of hundreds of thousands of uh, ex-Soviet citizens who are now citizens of Israel, who do not identify as Jewish, but are um, uh, still granted immediate citizenship in Israel. How does the secular elite come to terms with it? Um, you could see the, the, the tension, it's there. You, one could expect the liberal position to be simply, well, you know, this is the situation, this is the setting. It has now created a reality where Israel is no longer divided between Jews and Arabs as you know, the fundamental uh, schism has been created. But uh, now there are others, a large group of uh, non-Jews, non-Arabs who are nevertheless loyal citizens of, uh, of the state, they service it. The fact that the secular elite sees this as a problem to the degree to which that Ariel Sharon, now Ariel Sharon is not religious, was not religious. He was not a leftist, he was not necessarily a liberal Zionist, but he was uh, an authentic explicator of secularist Zionism, I think, like as, any, as good as any other. Ariel Sharon's government designated the solution to this problem a national mission. So first it designated as a problem that there are a few hundred thousand of non-Jews, non-Arabs in Israel. And then it uh, devotes resources as a national mission to help them cease to be non-Jews, non-Arabs. How do they do that? They take them by the hand to the religious courts and they help them convert by the rabbis. Specific, usually doing this while these people are serving in the army. So you get this fascinating reality where soldiers sit in uniform, in classes where they study about the orthodox interpretation of Jewish law, which most Israelis neither know about nor, nor care, and, uh, and then handed over to rabbinical courts where rabbis who view the service in the army as corrupting and dangerous to their own uh, uh, community, um, ask them about religious law. And then if they pass it, they can, in a sense, uh, take off the, the religious garb. Um, this happens again, I, have, you know, I can't stress this enough, this happens under the political dominance and uh, control of a secular majority. So um, we have time just for one uh, last question. Uh, and I'd like to, and, and uh, this is a question that comes from Rabbi Chaim Said Lefella, who's the longtime uh, rabbi at our UCLA here and a community leader here in Los Angeles. Um, and he's asking the, the, the question that maybe is on everybody's minds at this point, you know, is there, ha, what, what would you propose is the way out of this dilemma? Um, is, there a, is, there, is there a solution or is it just kind of baked in to the very nature of Judaism, if you like? Uh, it, this is the hardest question and, um, uh, and I've, I'm asked this time and again and I think, in a sense, I'm, uh, I'm a bit reluctant to offer my answer or an answer. I, I'm very happy to say what I think should be or could be a way of dealing with it, which is different than what has been done until now. I think the main handling of the Jewish identity crisis in Israel has been denial, and denial is obviously not, uh, not a solution. Um, I think the way to start and think about it anew, and then maybe come up with potential solutions, is to have a genuine Jewish engagement with the issue. And in this regard, I think non-Israeli Jewish communities uh, can contribute much more than we usually expect them to do in the case of Israel, because one of the triumphs of the state of Israel has been its ability to dominate the definition of Jewish politics. To the degree to which, and I don't have to tell, I mean, 
now we have to play, uh, change places though, but the degree to which that I, uh, one of the main features of the uh, diasporic or uh, non-Israeli Jewish identity has been its relation to the state of Israel. Uh, but uh, non-Israeli Jewish communities do have a, an advantage in the sense that they can hold the discussion in somewhat more abstract level, which is not immediately necessitating translation into Knesset laws. So we can have, for example, uh, uh, a, a, a renewed thinking, not only on the categories, as you uh, mentioned earlier, trying to think about ourselves, or you know, I'm talking as an Israeli Jew, or as a Jew, or as a now a member of the Oxford Jewish community, not only about ourselves as members of these communities and uh, people who relate in some way to the way politics is Jewish politics is defined in Israel, but also as carriers of tradition who would challenge, question, and reconstruct some of those uh, 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 conceptions, main conceptions. We could redefine. We, I think, it has to be a collective effort. This is why I'm so reluctant to give an answer. Uh, I'm not Trotsky. I don't have a revolutionary uh, uh, impetus here to convince all of you and to speak for you. But I think as a collective, if uh, uh, representatives of, or leaders of the Jewish people throughout engage with questions of uh, reconstructing the meaning of Jewish politics, and then aiming them at the state of Israel, either as a critique or as an advice or as a yearning or as a horizon towards which um, Israeli politics can um, progress, hopefully with a counterpart to this discussion within Israel, which I think is happening, I think it is you know, brewing at least, um, then this identity crisis I'm talking about would not necessarily be just a fatal element, you know, a, 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 a reality that we don't like and we have to acknowledge. It could be something that we see other ways of looking at. Interestingly, um, I, I, I recall that in the 19, in the late 40s, early 50s, I can believe Ben Gurion tried to initiate some sort of, uh, maybe not exactly a dialogue between Jewish thinkers in the dialogue, but he certainly reached out to many, you know, uh, eminent Jewish thinkers yes. to ask them their views on Jewishness and Jewish identity, and then ultimately, I guess, kind of went with the ultra-Orthodox uh, definition. Um, I know, personally, you've given me lots to think about. I'm sure um, all of our listeners here today have you know, been given a lot of really interesting food, food for thought. I really want to thank you, uh, Professor Yadgar, for, for talking about your book. I want to encourage everybody who's joined us uh, today to go out, if you don't have a copy already, uh, to, to obtain a copy uh, where you can see Professor Yadgar really explaining uh, this complex issue uh, and exploring it in terms of how it affects contemporary Israeli politics. So thank you all for joining us. There will be a recording of this. Thank you, Professor Yadgar, particularly for, uh, for sharing your wisdom with us this afternoon. And uh, please join us again for future uh, book talks that we will be putting on in the uh, weeks and months to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.